And we're in John chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. And I believe this is the fourth sermon in this section of Scripture. Uh, appreciate you bearing with me as we work through these texts. Um, these texts, although we try to look at paragraphs in the Scripture and uh, stick to specific paragraphs, uh, these paragraphs are chock full of biblical truth, and so oftentimes it will take us some time to work through those. Uh, we don't want to go so slow that we're not making progress and we lose sight of the book as a whole, but we don't want to go too quickly either. We want to dig into these passages and learn what the Lord would have us learn. And so as we would find ourselves this morning in John chapter 16, we've been working through verses 1 through 15. We come this morning to verse 12. As we consider this passage and the remaining verses in this section of scripture this morning, uh, the context of a passage like this should really consider us to remember how weak and how needy we are. In one sense, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples here. And in considering our weakness, in considering our, oftentimes our ignorance, our proneness to wander, um, the difficulty that we often have with understanding and applying the word of God, we also need to remember how gracious, uh, how merciful, how patient, right? How compassionate the Lord Jesus Christ is to us. In John chapter 16, remembering the context, setting the table, so to speak, it's the night of the Lord's arrest uh, at the hands of a wicked traitor. It's the night before his scourging, the night before his crucifixion at Golgotha, and the Lord is making his way with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, in the garden where he will agonize in prayer over the cup that is set before him. And that cup is filled to the brim with the terrors of the wrath of God do our sin. The wrath of God reserved for me. The wrath of God reserved for you. It's a cup that he will soon drink to the dregs in our place in our stead, on our behalf. Having loved his own who are in the world, we're reminded he loves them to the end. In the garden, over that cup, he will pray with such anguish that in furrowing his brow, bursting the capillaries in such anguish that he sweats, as it were, great drops of blood. What are the disciples doing while he's praying in the garden? They're sleeping. They're sleeping right? This passage of scripture gives us the account of what's happening the last night of the Lord's earthly life, the earthly ministry, the last night before he dies for them on the cross. And with all that he's facing, he's imparting to them gracious and loving last words. And in light of that, their hearts, their minds swirling on this night with thoughts other than him. <laughs> they have an argument in Luke chapter 22 over who will be the greatest among them. In this context, in this context, they have an argument amongst themselves over who's going to be the greatest they enter the upper room in John chapter 13, and no one humbles themselves to wash his feet. After three years in ministry with him, they show their ignorance by asking him to show them the Father in John chapter 14. And John chapter 16 explains that in just a few short hours, the disciples will forsake him being scattered. They will be offended at him. They leave each their own home, leaving him alone. So often, right, to our shame, we're just like these disciples. We behave often like spoiled, ignorant, self-absorbed children, not knowing our left hand from the right. But consider with me from John chapter 16, the Lord's mercy, the Lord's patience toward us. Rather than rebuke them in John chapter 16, verse 12, the Lord says to them, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. That's gracious, isn't it? That's merciful. It's a wonder of God's mercy and grace that he told them anything at all, right? That he reveals anything. He stoops, he condescends to reveal himself to us. And yet his tender mercy is focused on them as they walk along this path toward the garden. 
the riches of his goodness, right? The riches of his forbearance, his long suffering. In a hymn by Isaac Woodbury, a hymnist writes, mindful of our human frailty is the God in whom we trust. He whose years are everlasting, he remembers we are dust. Now, another reason from verse 12 that they can't bear these things now is because of their place in redemptive history. One, the weakness of their flesh, their ignorance, their frailty. They don't have the ability. Verse 12 speaks of ability. The word cannot. They cannot bear them now. But another reason that they cannot, they don't have the ability to bear them now, is because of their place in redemptive history. They don't have the ability yet to understand or to bear these things on this side of the cross, on their side of the cross. It wasn't possible yet for Christ to, to dive into so many great truths about his substitutionary death, right? His atonement for sinners. Great truths about his resurrection, those things are only fully understood in light of the cross, on this side of the cross. They were in no position yet to understand those things. But lastly, they weren't able to bear them because many things that he writes here, he has to say to us, are only understood by the illuminating and elucidating work of the Spirit of God in the life of a believer. Look at verse 13. However, when he... The spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. Now, that is a glorious promise. Amen? A glorious promise. The gift of the spirit is a promise given to believers. And it is a needed gift. Right? We desperately need the work of the spirit of God. We need the indwelling of the spirit of God. Turn back with me to John chapter 14. And look at verse 16, the Lord speaking regarding this gift. John chapter 14, verse 16. The Lord Jesus Christ says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give to you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. As part of the new covenant, God says in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, he says, I will put my spirit within you and will cause you to walk in my statutes. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So if you're a Christian, if you've come to know Christ, if you've turned from your sin and you've put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been born again by the Spirit of God, then you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Now, that's a promise. That's a gift of God as part of the new covenant. And it is a glorious gift. In fact, the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, if you're a genuine Christian, then the Holy Spirit dwelling within you is evidence that you are a genuine Christian. Let me ask you the question. Do you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you? Do you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you? John would say later in 1 John chapter 3, verse 24, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. We know that we abide in him, and he in us by the Spirit whom God has given us. Do you have the Spirit of God? In 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, John writes, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Has there been a work of the spirit of God in your heart? Do you see the fruit of the spirit of God at work in your heart? Not perfectly. You're going to go instantaneously from lost, wretched sinner to holy saint. <laughs> There's a work of God that takes place in your heart, though the work of the Spirit of God in your heart to make you more and more like Christ, to make you more and more holy. Has there been a work of God's Spirit in your heart? Now notice in John chapter 14, verse 26 there, that he's called another helper. John chapter 14, verse 16, another helper. The Lord means another helper like me. That's what he's talking about here. The Holy Spirit is not a force it's not an energy. You having the Spirit of God is not like you plugging yourself into an outlet, right? 
The Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity. The word here for helper is parakletos. It's derived from a verb meaning to call to one side. To call to one side. It's used in the sense of exhorting, encouraging, helping. In other words, as Christ departs to go to the Father, he sends the Spirit of God to minister to genuine Christians in his place and on his behalf. He sends another helper, another helper like him. Jesus Christ is called a parakletos in 1 John. Here, the spirit, the parakletos. Now, last sermon in our text, we saw that the helper here, the parakletos, point three, is at work in the world. Look at verse, chapter 16, verse 7. The helper, the spirit of truth, the spirit of God, the parakletos, is at work in the world. Nevertheless, verse 7, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now this week, this week, as we look at uh, chapter 16, verses 12 through 15... The Spirit of God is now taking up residence in the people of God. And we see point four on your notes, the Holy Spirit's work in the church. Now, the Spirit's work in the church is a multifaceted work. Many things that the Spirit does, many ways in which the Spirit benefits or blesses the people of God. Many ways in which the Spirit of God ministers to the people of God. And these are tremendous blessings bestowed on the people of God by the Spirit of God. However, in John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, there are two primary ways discussed by John in which the the Spirit blesses the people of God. One, he's at work in the church glorifying Christ by leading or guiding in truth. That's verse 13. He's at work in the church glorifying Christ by leading or guiding in truth. Secondly, He's at work in the church, glorifying Christ by declaring the truth. That's verses 14 and 15. So now think about the context with me now. As the disciples were encouraged by the Lord Jesus Christ with the work of the Spirit in the world, their ministry being to a lost world, to preach the gospel to a lost world, the Spirit of God at work in the world through the gospel preached to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, The Lord Jesus Christ, now in John John chapter 16, works to encourage the disciples with the work of the Spirit of God in them. (laughs) The work of the Spirit of God in the church. Point four on your notes, the Spirit is at work in the church. Look at verse 13 with me. We see first the way that the Spirit is at work in the church. He is glorifying Christ by leading or guiding in truth. Verse 13 says this. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come... He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now notice first in verse 13 that he is referred to here as the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. Now first, this clearly communicates something important regarding the essential nature of the Holy Spirit. Right? He is the spirit of truth. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 says the Spirit is truth. What's being communicated by this term, this title, is something about the nature of God, the nature of the Spirit of God here. The Spirit of God doesn't lie, right? The Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of God never contradicts himself. He never lies. He never contradicts himself. He never contradicts the Word of God. He works through the word of God. He is closely connected with the word of God. He is truth. God is the source of truth, the spirit of God, the source of truth. He will not contradict the word of God. He will not contradict himself. He will not guide in any way that is contrary to his word. And he will not lead in any way that is contrary to his word. He will not dispense gifts in a way that is contrary to the word of God. He's not going to do it. He is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth does not lie. The spirit of truth does not contradict himself. It's fundamental, right, to the essential nature of God 
that God, and here God the Spirit, is truthful in all things. Now that should be comforting to the people of God, right? The Spirit of truth will not lead you in error. We want to know the truth. We go to the Word of God, and the Word of God revealed to us by the Spirit of God. He leads us into truth. doesn't lead us in a way that will be contrary to the Word. These things aren't shifting and transitory. They're not shadows, right? These things are clear. They're elucidated clearly, and they are truth. We can take it to the bank because the Word of God says it, right? And the Spirit of God is confirming that. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19 The Bible says of God that he's not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Our God makes it good, right? Anything that he says, we can trust him completely. He is the spirit of truth. Now, however... What's being communicated here by that title goes beyond just describing one of God's divine perfections, right? One of the attributes of God. There's more that's involved in the title here. Secondly, the spirit of truth not only is truth, he communicates the truth. He communicates the truth. And he he does that through two primary means. He communicates the truth through two primary means. One means is inspiration, Another means is illumination, inspiration and illumination. Let's look at inspiration first, right? Now remember in John chapter 16, who the Lord is speaking to here. Remember who he's speaking to here. He's talking to the disciples. These are men that the spirit of God would inspire to write the Bible, all right? One of those men that is there at this time is John. And we're reading John's gospel this morning. All right? Now he tells them, these men in verse 13, he tells them that when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Look back again at John chapter 14 and look at verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26, where the Lord says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. A good example of this promise A good example of the blessed work of the Holy Spirit in this is the Gospel of John. It's the Bible that you have in your hands right now. That's a fulfillment of that promise, a fulfillment of that gift. John was there as the Lord was explaining this. So the Holy Spirit came, guided John into truth, called to John's remembrance all things that Christ had said, and you have the result of the Spirit's communication to John in your hands. And we're reading here in the Gospel of John this morning, right? That's how the Lord works. That's how the Spirit works through inspiration. Look with me at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to go through a couple of texts with you that discuss this. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And look with me at verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. And here Paul says in verse 16, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now remember, we're talking about two means by which the Holy Spirit communicates truth, inspiration and illumination. The first of these, inspiration. And here Paul says in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means God breathed, theopneustos. God breathed. It's interesting in chapter 16, verse 13, that the spirit there, the word for spirit is pneumas, meaning breath. He's called pneumas tesalathias, the breath of truth. Here, his theopneustos, inspiration, is God, theos, pneustos, breathed, God breathed, right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now this truth in mind, therefore, the word of God is not a matter of one's own interpretation. It is God breathed. God breathed it out by the Holy Spirit. Now what does that mean? Does that mean when I come to scripture, I can look at scripture and say, well, what, 
what does scripture mean to me? <laughs> what do I think this means? What do you think? This I have my interpretation. You have your interpretation. Turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. It's not the way this works. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God's inspiration, God's breath. God breathes it out. It comes from God. God is its source. The spirit of truth here specifically is its source. Look in 2 Peter chapter 1. And look at verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, of foremost importance, knowing this first, that no prophecy, no writing, no giving of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, the, the word interpretation there is an unfortunate translation. It refers to source, right? It refers to source. No prophecy of Scripture is of any private source, any private interpretation, verse 21, for prophecy never came by the will of man. Prophecy, Scripture, God's truth, never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. No truth of God, no truth of God has ever come about through the will of man. We understand the implications of that, right? Right? Here, the Greek word is a genitive of source. It refers to the source or the origin of the word of God. Man is never the source of divine truth. The source of the meaning of divine truth is never man. Never man. You can't look at the scripture and say, well, what does this mean to me, right? You can't put a bunch of guys in a committee, in a room, and have them all come up with some interpretation of Scripture, and that becomes the authoritative interpretation of that passage. The meaning of Scripture never comes by the will of man. The source of Scripture, the interpretation of Scripture, the meaning, the understanding, never comes from man. God is the source. The spirit of truth is the source. The source. Rather here, specifically, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That word moved means carried along. In Acts chapter 27, that word is used to show how a ship is carried along the waters toward its destination, driven by the wind, right? Carried along. In this sense, these men were carried along by the Holy Spirit, the writing of Scripture. In other words here, again, men are not the source of truth. Truth is not open to man's limited understanding. We need to go to the Bible to get authorial intent. We need to go to the word of God to find out what God intends, what God means by what God wrote. It means you can't put a man in a funny hat, call him the vicar of Christ, and expect truth to come from him. You can't do it. You, men can't contextualize the truth to better fit our culture. You can't contextualize the word of God to get women pastors to get homosexual pastors, to make it okay for a sodomite to be a Christian. You can't do it. For that matter, you can't find justification in Scripture for an adulterer to be a Christian or a drunkard to be a Christian. Truth isn't determined by a majority vote of the membership in some denomination. And that, that happens all the time. Look at denominations that meet and they'll have a vote on what a passage means to them in their context at this time. Truth isn't determined by your experience. In other words, your experience is not the source or the determiner or the arbiter of truth. Your experience has to be run through the filter of God's word. Truth is contained in the word of God as it has been inspired by the spirit of truth. Inspired and illuminated by the spirit of God. Now, be sure that if that word comes from the spirit of truth, it is true. It is true. And if it's true, then someone who believes in inspiration, right? If, if the Holy Spirit cannot lie, if the Holy Spirit cannot contradict himself, then anyone who believes that the word of God is inspired, which most people would, must of necessity believe that the word of God is inerrant which most people don't. <laughs> I don't understand the disconnection there. The Spirit of God cannot lie. 
The Spirit of God will not contradict himself. And so if you believe in the inspiration of the Word of God, you must of necessity hold to the inerrancy of the Word of God. The Word of God is true. It is infallible. It is inerrant. Every word. And that is because it is inspired by the Spirit of truth. The work of inspiration by the Spirit of God is done. That work of inspiration is done. In other words, when somebody writes a hymn today, it's not inspired, right? When somebody prays, it's not an inspired prayer. (laughs) When somebody writes a book, it's not inspired. Somebody makes a movie, it's not inspired. Somebody says they have a word of prophecy, not inspired. (laughs) The work of inspiration now is done. There is no additional revelation being given. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. You're in 2 Peter, just Hebrews, James, Peter. Turn back a few pages. Hebrews chapter 1. It's important to have these things firm in your thinking, in our minds, as we consider the word. It's so important, right? So important to your Christian life. So important to our understanding that we know what the Bible teaches on these things. And it requires diligence. It requires study. It requires the Spirit of God to bring us understanding, Right? Hebrews chapter 1, and look at verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. Now, when he says that in verse 1, various times, various ways, in time past. Now, consider those with me for a moment. In various times, ages before this one, in history, redemptive history, God, in various times before this one, spoke in various ways, spoke through prophets, communicated through vision, communicated through a dream, one time communicated through a donkey, right? God is in times past, in various times, and in various ways, he spoke in times past, to the fathers here by the prophets, by the prophets. And he has in these last days now spoken to us in visions. No. He has in these last days spoken to us by words of prophecy. No. He has in these last days spoken to us through dreams. No, no, no. Those are various times and in various ways in time past in which he spoke to the fathers by the prophets. In these last days... He has spoken to us by his son. Do you see that? Now, most of what you see today revealed that comes under the moniker of revelation from God is wrong. And the spirit of God cannot lie. And the spirit of God will not contradict himself. And the spirit of God will not ever prophesy anything that does not come to pass. The spirit of God does not lie. He is the spirit of truth. Most of what you see today grossly contradicts what Scripture clearly teaches. It grossly, we'll take a look at a passage in a little while, it grossly contradicts what Scripture clearly teaches. Most of what you see today that would come under the moniker, the title of revelation from God, is done or taught by overtly false teachers in overtly false churches by overtly ungodly people. And he is the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of truth. Most of what you see today is reproduced or replicated in all false religion. (laughs) In false religion. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're just taking a look at a, a cursory look, if you will, at some of the teaching of Scripture with respect to this. It's important we build this foundation. Ephesians chapter 2. And look at verse 19. Again, we're talking about the inspiration of the Spirit of God with the Word of God. The fact that that inspiration is now done. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 19. Now therefore, you, brothers and sisters, we... 
We're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now that household of God, verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What is that? What is it referring to when it says apostles and prophets? Referring to scripture. Apostolic teaching. Apostolic teaching The prophets, Old Testament. Often the word prophets used to summarize the Old Testament. The New Testament apostles, the Old Testament prophets, that foundation, the household of God being built on the foundation of God's word. Foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom now the whole building, right, the church being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. On the foundation, the bedrock foundation, the granite slab foundation of God's word, teaching of the apostles, the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, the whole building now, the people of God, the church, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. The spirit of God, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. Do you see? Revelation chapter 22, 18 says this, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. There'll be folks that will try to do hermeneutical gymnastics with that passage to think that you just can't add to the book of Revelation. No, Revelation is the close of the canon. From Genesis to Revelation, we have God's intended, revealed truth given to us in Christ, in his son, in its completion, elucidated and illuminated by the spirit of God. We have God's revelation. We have the Bible, God's intended revelation in our hands. Genesis to Revelation. If you add to that, He will add to you the plagues that are written in the book. If you take away from that, he'll take away your part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. The idea of new revelation, right? The idea of new inspiration is common to all cults. It's common to cults. It's common to all false religion. It's common in the Roman Catholic Church, right? It's common in the Roman Catholic Church. Adding writings to scripture that have been passed down by popes and councils. It's adding to the revelation of God, God's intended revelation. Adding the Apocrypha in 1546. Uninspired books added for an ulterior agenda. 1546, the Apocrypha added to God's word. The Bible that you have, the 66 books of the Bible that you have in your hands is the word of God. That's the word of God that's been given, been inspired by the Spirit of God. God does still speak today. How does God speak? He speaks through his word. He speaks through his word. That's so important for the Christian to understand this. So important. For the Christian, you're in Ephesians 2. Just flip the page to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Look at how important this is. Look at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, brother, sister, listen. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And as of first importance in our taking up the armor of God, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Right? The first piece of our armor that we're to take up is truth. And that truth given to us by inspiration of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Now, secondly, he works through inspiration, communicates truth through inspiration. Secondly, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, communicates truth through illumination. Illumination. The spirit of God 
works in the life of a believer to apply the truths of God's word to your heart and mind. The Spirit of God, given the specific task of taking the word of God, pointing to Christ, glorifying Christ, and illuminating your mind, your understanding, by applying the truths of God word, God's word to your heart and mind. That's done through illumination. And we desperately need the Spirit of God to do that work in us, through us, right? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We need the Spirit of God to do this work. We need the Spirit of God to illumine our understanding, to guide us, so to speak, into truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 6. Verse 6, right? And this referencing this work of the Spirit of God in illumination. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. However, Paul says, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. That mystery there that he's referring to is the gospel. The gospel, right? The wisdom of God in the gospel. Verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, the, when the Lord Jesus Christ addressed the Pharisees, or when he was in confrontation with the Pharisees, he told them in John chapter 5, he says to them, listen, you search the scriptures because you believe that in them you have eternal life. But they, those scriptures, are they which testify of me, the Lord Jesus Christ says, right? It's going to point to Christ. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory if they knew the truth, if the truth had been illuminated to them. The Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 5, telling that to Pharisees who were obsessed with the Old Testament scriptures. Many of them had large swaths, if not all, of the Old Testament committed to memory. So he told them, those men who were obsessed with the Old Testament scriptures, much of the Old Testament scripture memorized, they had it committed to their memory, and he told them, you search those scriptures, because in them, you believe that you have eternal life, and yet those are the scriptures that point to me, right? Those are the scriptures that concern me. In other words, they don't know the scriptures, although they had them memorized, although they were obsessed with them. What would it have taken? It would have taken the Spirit of God to open their understanding, right? Like Lydia, having her heart opened, her understanding opened to understand the things spoken by Paul. We need the Spirit of God to illuminate the Scriptures to our heart and mind. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 9. It is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us, believers, through his Spirit. Do you see that? That's the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. You may have met, I've witnessed to guys before, that knew their Bibles inside and out. Talked to guys that are, are biblical scholars, and yet they are dead concerning the things of God. No understanding of the scriptures. We need the spirit of God to reveal them to us. God, verse 10, has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, in the same way, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might know, so that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. We need the Spirit of God. Amen? These things, verse 13, we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You know, it's It's... Very troubling in scripture, but it's also troubling in the church. When you have someone that professes Christ, they profess to be indwelt by the spirit, they profess to be Christians, but over a period of time, right? A lengthy amount of time, they just never make progress. Never understand the word of God. 
always searching, so to speak, never coming to a knowledge of the truth. It's because the Spirit of God is not at work there, right? We need the Spirit of God. We need to make progress in the Word of God, depending upon the Spirit of God for that progress. Verse 15, he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? We have the mind of Christ. This illuminating work of the Spirit of God extends to all Christians. In John chapter 16, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking specifically to the disciples and that illuminating work of the Spirit of God to remind the disciples of all things that Christ has said to them. And they'll, in the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, will write Scripture. But this work of the Spirit of God in illuminating the Word of God extends to Christians in this sense. We need the Spirit of God to illuminate the Scriptures to us. You know, professing Christians, right? Always attempting to find or discern truth apart from the Word of God. Finding truth in any number of things, right? You read some of these terrible books found, you know, Finding theology in some movie. <laughs> finding theology in some poem. Some song just moved me, you know. Always attempting to find or discern or follow truth as they see it, as they think it, apart from the word of God. That is impossible. It doesn't exist apart from the word of God. Or professing quote-unquote Christians always attempt to find or discern the leading of God apart from the illumination or the application of the word of God by the spirit of God. Heard it said this way, this way, the spirit of God without the word of God is like oil without a lamp. Oil without a lamp may cause a flash, right? But not sustained light. It's like heat without light. You know churches like that, don't you? You know Christians, professing Christians like that. All heat, no light. Word without the spirit is like light without heat. It's dead, lifeless, dry. It's like a lamp with no oil. One pastor put it this way. The word without the spirit and you dry up. The spirit without the word and you blow up. <laughs> you put the two together and you grow up. Right? Back in John chapter 16, verse 13. The Lord says in verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. When he comes, he will guide you, it says there, into, better translated in, right? He will guide you in all truth. In other words, he's going to guide you in the truth that's already been revealed. He's going to guide you, specifically the disciples here, are going to guide them in new revelation. He's going to guide them in all truth. Now, based on our understanding of inspiration here, the truth that he's leading you into is not whether you should marry that girl. <laughs> it's not whether you should take that job. You know, I've been thinking about getting a tattoo. I'm going to pray about it. And Lord, you know, if you want me to get the tattoo, just don't say anything, Lord, and I'll take that as a yes that I should get that tattoo. <laughs> that is absurd. <laughs> now, we laugh about that, but how many circumstances in your life where you've skirted doing just that, maybe have done that in your life? We don't understand how the Spirit of God leads through the Word of God, how he guides into all truth. All truth here is referring to the whole counsel of God, the entirety of the revealed Word of God, that which God has intended to be revealed to us. It's the 66 books of your Bible, not the Apocrypha, added in 1546. It's the 66 books of your Bible, the whole counsel of God. Now, as he explains here, that when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide us into all truth. He then gives us an explanation for this. And the explanation begins with the word for there, halfway through verse 13. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. 
and he will tell you things to come. Now first, it says there in explanation of the guiding of the spirit of truth, the explanation is that one, he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. The spirit of truth in this does exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ does, right? The Lord Jesus Christ says, I always speak those things which I heard from the Father. The spirit of truth has the same priority. In other words, there's a, there's a perfect unity in the Godhead. There's a perfect unity of both word, a perfect unity of work, a perfect unity in the revelation that's given, that perfect unity existing within the Godhead. He does not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, that's what he speaks. Secondly, it says here that he will tell you things to come. Tell you things to come. And that's not merely eschatologically, speaking of end times things. For them, that started right away. He's going to tell you things that are to come. Speaking of all future revelation to them until the canon is complete, all right? Now, the Spirit of God in this work from verse 13 has a purpose, has a purpose to his ministry of communicating and illuminating the truth. That purpose is found in verse 14. He will glorify me. The Spirit's work in illuminating, in communicating truth, is to glorify Christ. Now think with me about that for a moment. The Spirit of God did not come to magnify and glorify himself. The Spirit of God did not come to magnify and glorify himself in that sense, though he is worthy of glory. The Spirit of God came to point to Christ, to glorify him. He will glorify me, verse 14, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Verse 15, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. In chapter 14, verse 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things, Christ says, that I said to you. The Holy Spirit is not off on his own. He's not running some rogue mission, right? He's not running his own program here. It's not that the Spirit of God is off doing one thing now, the Spirit of God does, that's totally different from what Christ did or from what God did in the Old Testament. There's a continuity and there's a unity to God's revelation and God's redemptive purposes. And the Spirit of God, in perfect unity with the Godhead, exercises his role to that end. He's not giving new revelation to people now. That's not happening. He points to what Jesus Christ has said. In chapter 15, verse 26, the Lord says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Now think about it with me. To know Christ, to know Christ is eternal life, is eternal life. God has revealed his redemptive purposes, his plans for man, for you and I to be right with God. We're going to be right with God through repentant faith in Christ. All of those purposes, all of those plans of God, the redemptive purposes of God from the fall to revelation is about God redeeming his people to himself. Why would the spirit ever come in contradiction or contrary to any of that work? It's simply not going to do it. The Spirit of God is in alignment, in unity with the Godhead for those purposes to be fulfilled. And those purposes and plans are all fulfilled, all wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now the Spirit of God works to point to him. Christ says that he, the Spirit of truth, will take what is mine and declare it to you. Look with me at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. That's the Spirit's role. He will take what is mine, Christ says, and declare it to you. 1 John chapter 4, and look at verse 1. This is again John, John's later epistle here, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. I was speaking with someone not long ago, and just... <laughs> justification for their own belief, where they're at, indiscriminately believing everything that goes on in the world today with respect to revelation, <laughs> with respect to gifts of the Spirit. But here, John is specifically warning, don't believe every spirit. 
Test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Don't we know it, right? Verse 2, by this you know that the spirit of, uh, know the spirit of God. Every spirit that points to Christ, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess, does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world at the time that John was writing this epistle. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In other words, those that hear them know God. Their word lines up with apostolic teaching, lines up with what the Bible says. How do you test the spirits? You test the spirits here by the word of God. He is, again, the spirit of truth, not a spirit of error, not a spirit of confusion, not a spirit of contradiction. He's the spirit of truth. Many times today, you see those with revelation. They claim to speak on behalf of God. They've got some new inspiration, some new word, some new prophecy, some new vision. And they are those who disobey Christ by their lives denying the Lord who they claim bought them. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, they are not of Christ. They are not of Christ. Many of those that we see today, right? One divorce after another. One adulterous relationship after another. Greedy, covetousness, worldly, prideful, not of Christ. Line up those spirits by the word of God. Christ says that the spirit of truth will take what is mine and declare it to you. Let's get a prime example of that. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And let's get a look, take a look at the spirit's work doing exactly this. Christ says he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Acts chapter 2. And look at verse 1. The Spirit's work is to point to Christ, to show that the Scriptures are about Christ. It's all about Christ. In verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if you look down at verse 16, this is in fulfillment of prophecy. Joel had prophesied that this would take place. Verse 16, Peter says, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. They shall prophesy. Now, that's the prophecy of Joel. Look at the actual fulfillment of that prophecy. Look at verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. These are actual languages. They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. That's the biblical gift of tongues, right? That's not what we see today. Now what does the Spirit do? We have in chapter 2 an account of of the Spirit of God given at Pentecost. This is what was prophesied. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about when he said the Spirit would come, right? The Spirit has come in Acts chapter 2, and what is the very first thing 
that the Spirit does through the preaching of Peter when the Spirit comes at Pentecost. Look at verse 22. Peter stands up and preaches, and he says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. He immediately points to Christ. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him, Christ, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he, Christ, should be held by it. He points to Christ. Why was the Spirit given in the way that it was at Pentecost? To point to Christ. Why were the signs and the wonders and the miracles done? To point to Christ. Now we have the revealed word of God through which the Spirit of God works to point to Christ. Those things aren't happening that way any longer. The gibberish that you hear today is not the gift of the Holy Spirit. Settle it in your heart and mind, folks. He says in verse 33, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says of himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. What does the Spirit of God immediately do in this inspired sermon of Peter at Pentecost? He points to Christ. You know, in fact, when the focus is on the Spirit rather than on Christ, it's a good indication it's not of the Spirit. <laughs> All things that the Father has are mine, the Lord Jesus Christ says. Therefore, I said, the spirit of truth, he will take what is of mine and declare it to you. Let me give you one example of a false teacher. Look with me at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 23. Everything must be run through the filter of the truth of God. He is the spirit of truth. He will not contradict himself. He will not contradict God's word. He will not lie. All must be run through the filter of Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 23. Look at verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord, and many of those churches who sit under those false teachers, those false teachers are making them worthless. Verse 17, they continually say to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. To everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own hearts, they say, no evil shall come upon you. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and heard his word? Who has marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. You see? If they had spoken God's word. God's word does not go out void. It accomplishes the purpose for which it goes out. And if they had spoken God's word, they would have turned them from their evil way, from the evil of their doings. God says in verse 23, Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed a dream. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. Do you see? 
who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. He who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, God says, I am against the prophets who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says. Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. All of this has application for us today, doesn't it? Those words could have been written now, (laughs) just as applicable today. And we talked about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. One of the applications for you and I, brother and sister, today is that we need to take up the inspired word, inspired by the spirit of truth. We need to take up the inspired and inerrant word of God. One commentator said, the appalling ignorance of many Christians concerning the things of the word of God is directly traceable to their carnality and their failure in seeking the blessing of a life filled with the spirit. The modern so-called church has largely lost her moorings. They've abandoned the word of God. Having abandoned the word of God, the so-called church is on a foundation of shifting sand. Examples of this abound, don't they? Prioritize the word of God. Take up the word of God. We talked about the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. We need the spirit of God to give us illumination, don't we? to give us understanding. We need the spirit of God to help us understand, to lead us, to guide us into the truth as it is in Christ. We're to depend upon the Holy Spirit. We need the spirit of God. So what are we to do? We're to pray. We're to pray. We're to depend upon the uh, the spirit of God as we read and study the word of God. We're to seek him in his word. You and I have to acknowledge that we are often dull-hearted. We are often of dull minds, We have clogged ears and fogged eyes. And we need the Spirit of God. Take heed how you hear, right? Take heed how you hear. The Spirit of God's work through the Word of God is to sanctify you, to sanctify me in the truth. His Word is truth. The Word in the hands, so to speak, of the Spirit of God is to elicit from you a response. We're to respond in faith. We're to respond in repentance. We're to respond in dependence upon him. We're to respond in greater love, greater affection for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to respond with more joy. We're to respond with obedience, devotion, commitment, fervency, zeal. We are to be transformed. That happens when the Spirit of God works in us through the Word of God. It's to draw forth a response. The Bible says that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because he, God, the spirit of God is at work in you to do and to will according to his good pleasure. First Thessalonians chapter four, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. He has given us of his spirit. Ephesians chapter four, we're not to grieve the Spirit of God. Ephesians chapter five, we're to be filled with the Spirit of God. Direct application, we just don't have time to go into all of these. There's so many applications, right? Direct application is, is our testimony, our witness for Christ. Remember that in John chapter 16, the specific context in which the Lord is speaking to them is in the context of their ministry now in this lost world with the gospel as Christ is departing and going to be with the Father. It's their evangelism. They're going to face a hostile, persecuting world. And he encourages them with the ministry of the Spirit to them that will provide the necessary help and strength and empowerment, revelation for their ongoing ministry. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
primary application. For those of you here today that are not in Christ, is the Spirit's work of causing sinners to be born again. That you would turn from your sin. You would humble yourself. Don't harden your heart. Call on, depend on the Spirit of God to break you over your sin. Better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Amen? Turn from your sin. Put your trust in Christ. Let the Spirit of God have his work in your heart this morning. Don't harden your heart. Submit to him. The Spirit of God is a tremendous blessing. And it's the Spirit by which we persevere to the end to be saved. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you. We thank you for this glorious gift of the Spirit of God. Lord, help us not to take that glorious gift for granted. Spirit of God, please have your way in our hearts and our minds. Help us to understand the word of truth. Sanctify us, Lord, by your truth. Help us. We need you. Thank you, Lord, for your work in us and through us according to your good pleasure. Thank you, Spirit of God, for having caused us to be born again. And thank you for your continued work of sanctification. We want, Lord, desire, we hunger and thirst for righteousness to be pleasing in your sight. Help us to this end for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.